Me acuerdo, a los 11 años estaba sentado con mi abuelo en un campo de olivos que él cultivaba toda la vida de sol a sol en unos overalls asquerosísimos, asquerosísimos esos overalls. Y él ese día agarró una barra de chocolate que había entre nosotros y la abrió pues violentamente, como un salvaje lo abrió. Y recuerdo que sentado al lado suyo en ese momento pensé, hostia, es que yo jamás lo habría abierto así. Si fuera yo, lo habría desenvuelto delicadamente, adecuadamente. Sans aucun style. For men learning to dress, one stylistic voice has risen above the rest. L'étiquette, le guide de l'élégance masculine. Moi, je me suis obnubilé, obnubilé avec ce magazine. And if you're asking yourself, am I going to have to listen to this fool and his stupid little accent for the rest of the video? Let me tell you something, my friend. The answer is, carrément. All right? Here's the deal on this channel, okay? I'm obsessed with French. Obsessed with French people, French culture. I got a bit, it's a bit of a fetish, a bit of a fetish. Now listen, Google the definition of fetish, okay? It's not sexual. It's just an unhealthy obsession. All right, it's a little bit sexual. It's a little bit sexual. They sound really sexy when they speak. It's very, oh, all right, look, it's completely sexual. It's very hot, you know, Gautier, mon chéri, ce weekend, tu, moi, Dîner, cinéma, promenade. Ouais, dis-le moi. Uh, Alright, what was I talking about? Um, Alright, this magazine, super cool magazine. Since coming across it a couple years ago, it has exposed me to just really thought-provoking stories, really cool stories that have not only changed the way I dress, but also just make the act of dressing myself much more meaningful. And today, we're going to analyze issues one through seven, and um, you know, the best outfits, the coolest stories, and I'm going to introduce you to three men whose philosophies have infused my style with romance, with literature, and with art. It's going to be insufferable. Uh, I, got my, <laughs> I got my pretentious little stash. I got my stupid little accent. We're going to over-intellectualize some shit. It's going to be great. And with that being said, on y va, c'est parti. Icy gusts pelt the slit eyes of Yvon Chouinard. Carabiners pierce into his chest, drawing blood. For 15 days, 15 days, he's been stuck on the side of El Monte Fitzroy. He's going over in his head. How the hell did I get here? What went wrong? In Guatemala, his camper van turned sideways in a flooded ditch. In Chile, a soldier cocking a gun at the roof of his mouth, accusing him of being CIA. And now he's awaiting death. He's awaiting death. His limbs are going black and blue. He's suffering from hypothermia. What does he do? Does he admit defeat? It wasn't supposed to be like this. Suddenly, a break in the clouds. Here's his chance. He summits El Monte Fitzroy. That evening, at base camp, with some Sherpas around the fire, he pulls out the bottle of good Argentine wine he'd saved specifically for this moment pours himself a tin, and takes a sip. My favorite interpretation of romance comes from Francisco Malman, un chef étoilé que recita poesía en francés en su cabaña en la Patagonia Profunda. Es un fenómeno. Es, podría ser el hombre más interesante, más elegante del mundo. Y para el argentino, romance is a feeling of mystery, of excitement, of remoteness from everyday life. Now, what the hell does romance have to do with clothes? In 2017, GQ writer Samuel Hine is given access to Patagonia's layer of 
prototype rugbies and one-of-one -one fleeces. They're big warehouse of secret archival stuff. One of the designers tells the journalist about his favorite interaction, his favorite memory with the founder, with Yvonne. And, uh, and the designer is explaining that he and Yvonne were talking about rain jackets. They were talking about waterproof, breathable technology. And the thing is, Yvonne tells the, the group of designers, what's wrong with sometimes being a little bit wet? The designer explains this jacket that they developed called the Houdini, it wasn't 100% water or windproof. It was just enough. It was just enough to get you home while you're running your ass off through a storm in the mountains. It doesn't protect you from the experience. It lets you have the experience. To quote Italian menswear patriarch Nino Ceruti, clothing, however trivial it may seem, is ultimately what touches our skin, right? It's what's closest to us. An example, my dad handed me down this beautiful deconstructed ivory jacket a couple years ago that he had bought years back in Marlebone. Now this ivory deconstructed jacket, I've worn this jacket to dance music festivals and gigs all over Europe. Honey Dijon, Chaos in the CBD, Carrie Chandler. In the stains, in the discoloration, in the tears, in the fiber of this jacket are embedded some of my happiest memories. Just complete and utter ecstasy, bliss. Some of my happiest memories alive are embedded in this jacket. And I think above all, that's what Let's Get has taught me. That's the first principle, is to basically assess my own moment at the summit, my own remote experiences, my memories, my adolescence, you know, the narratives and interests that make up my stylistic DNA. You know, instead of kind of thinking outwardly so much, you know, this is the cool brand right now, and that's the cool tea that everyone has, and I need that, I, you know, I need to rock that, turn inwards, right? Assess my own kind of style, you know, who I am and where I come from. You know, I think a good example of this in the magazine you got this guy, Jean-Baptiste Grenin, director artistique. Um, you know, he's talking about this shirt here. Une chemise comme celle-là, issue d'un uniforme militaire de la guerre d'Algérie, celui que mon père, colonel dans la Légion étrangère, portait. You know, this shirt has a narrative for him, right? It's got a, it's got a family, a family DNA. Uh, you know, this is a great example here. This, um, this guy's a painter. What's this guy's name? I also like to, um, I like to highlight the names because lots of these guys are really cool names. I'm not sure how you would say this. Dutch, duck. J'aime le motif peinture. Ce sont des teintes que j'utilise quand je peins. Presse pastel. All right, so these are the exact same colors that he uses when he paints. Again, the connection between you know the thread and then literally you know paint, ink. Um, you know, I think that's really beautiful. That's really romantic. You know, one of the one of the key convictions that um, that the guys who run this magazine make over and over is the sentimental connection that you can make with your clothing over time. If you're looking for you know the most badass pair of jeans with the perfect patina patine, you could maybe get it at some point if you you know you get lucky online, or you can wear the jeans you have, and over time they'll develop a, a patina. I think a good example of that. Yeah, this is this is a really cool look. You know, their, their point here is, you know, Converse never die. You know, they they just they just old, they age until they become, you know, claquette de plage. I think that's a really beautiful idea, right? So you look down at your Converse and you've got memories of Ibiza, and you know, I'm sounding like a um, like a a real European uh, <laughs> cocksucker here, but um, you know, great example here. What's this guy's name? David. I think this guy lives in Chicago. I follow this guy online. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's got this great, you know, Harlem Globetrotter shirt. He says that he met Ralph Lauren in this shirt one day. He was wearing this shirt in the streets of New York. And Ralph Lauren said, hey, cool shirt. Let me tell you something. You know, Ralph Lauren, I don't care what brand you're wearing, ALD, J. John, whatever these, whatever the cool brand is, you know, Ralph Lauren ain't telling you shit if you got the logo hip brand t-shirt on. He doesn't give a fuck about that. You know, just, just from an artistic point of view, right? You got this nice... Helvetica typography. You know, look at this shirt, man. It's worn. It's beat down. It's got a history. It's a, this is a living, this is a living, breathing garment, um, and I think that's why it resonates. That's where the respect comes from. Is it's it's got a story, right? It's got a narrative to it that's more profound than just this is the cool brand that all the guys in Berlin are wearing. Who cares about that? Uh, you know, I think one point to drive this home is you know this one pick of this tattoo. Do you care if if all the the hippest guys in London and Paris and Berlin are all getting a certain kind of tattoo? Of course not. You're not going to get a tattoo because everyone else is doing it, right? You want to, that tattoo has a, has a meaning for you and a narrative and a sentimentality about, you know, something you've overcome or a childhood or an adolescence. So I think it's a good way to think about, um, I think it's a good way to think about the romance is basically to assess your own moment at the summit. You know, what's your moment at the summit and what were you wearing, you know, and recognize that how, recognize that what you were wearing embodies who you are and who you were in that moment.
Cinq ans plus tard, Shuna se met à confectionner des chiottes chemises en flanelle. Je voulais faire des vêtements pour les conditions que j'ai découvertes en Patagonie. Pour les soirs avec ce couleur orange, ces nuages cristallins et ces grosses tempêtes. At the end of a dark hallway, an empty bureau. A seated silhouette, muscular legs crossed, sips champagne. Krug, always Krug. On the wall, framed in mahogany, a diploma from Notre Dame. Degree in economics. First job was in finance, as an auditor. Ditches, goes to Hollywood, wants to be an actor. This guy shortens his name to stand out. At 32, he moved to New York. He's just getting started. I think he gets a gig in Armani showroom. He's doing a couple of odd jobs. At 36, 2001, he finally figured out what he wants to do and he launches the first collection of his brand. The one, the only, Tom Brown. Honestly, the, uh, the story on this guy might be the most, this guy might be the most compelling person I came across through this magazine. He was kind of on my radar, but his, uh, his backstory and his life is really like something out of a, out of a book. He's, really, he's got a character to him. And, um, you know, Letty Kier writes, Tom devient sa propre égérie, right? He becomes his own muse which is honestly hilarious and sounds completely like something Kanye would say. Yo, Kanye, who's your muse? I am my own muse. It's like, all right, shut the hell up, bro. But, uh, but no, he does, Brown does have a sort of singular aura about him in kind of a Kanye, Steve Jobs kind of way. You know, Steve Jobs infamously had a really picky taste. He had a really hard time furnishing his own house. It was pretty much empty. Tom Brown was the same way. His office, his house, no books, no furniture. Steve Jobs similarly um, had an affinity for really bizarre diets. He would go weeks at a time only eating carrots to the point where he literally had like an orange hue at times. Brown similarly ate the same thing for lunch every day. A couple of slivers of salmon, right? He's like a fucking dolphin, this guy. I'm trying to create a world, the world of Tom Brown, which requires that everyone immerses themselves within it. This guy requires everyone, the employees, to wear a Tom Brown at the office. No other brands are allowed. There's some hilarious little anecdote in this article. Some employee wore pink socks one day, but in the day, he was no longer part of the company. Crazy. Also, um, passers-by, like, I don't know, people with Wi-Fi or they need to install something, like delivery guys, they also have to wear Tom Brown, which I don't really understand how that works. If there's like a closet full of different sizes for people who come in, it's kind of a mindfuck, the whole thing, but absolutely insane. Margaret Spagnolo, l'ancienne acheteuse en chef de Berg de Ruinman, notes that many designers over the years, they've changed their style. They've adapted their style to the market, thinking that it would bring them success. She says that Brown basically did the opposite. He had this vision, this taste for these hyper-shortened kind of tailoring and hyper-shortened suits, and he stuck with it. And you know, he built a brand that is now today worth $500 million. I find this story on Tom Brown really compelling for three reasons. One, I think it's cool that he didn't start his brand until 36. I think culturally there's this stigma around age and success and you know i'm 24 and there's so many people in my demographic who it's like i need to have you know career family homes sorted by 30. so i think it's cool that you have these guys like brown and even um a good example that comes to mind is tremaine emery right tremaine emery above uh, above age 40 now kind of the pinnacle of streetwear with the you know new creative direction at supreme i think if he you know spends his 20s and 30s sulking about why he's not you know the in some really um heralded position, you know, he's not getting anywhere, you know, by putting in his time at, you know, doing denim tiers and, um, and no vacancy in these different creative projects, you know, all these things kind of um, contribute to the ultimate vision, the ultimate success. Uh, so I think that's really cool. Secondly, it does lead me to believe that if you have a singular vision that you back up with, with good work, I think you'll ultimately find the market for it. That doesn't mean that you won't, you know, have failures along the way. I think Tom Brown in the article, you know, he did have hiccups, right? In, you know, some warehouses, you know, I've got, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of suits here. And it's, and, you know, buyers are saying, what the hell is this, man? What, no one wants these little childlike little short suits. What is this shit, right? So he had to kind of find eventually a niche for his vision, his taste in really short um, cuts. So yeah, I feel like ultimately, if you do have a singular vision that you back up with really good work, I think you'll find your place. Uh, and then thirdly, I think it's a great example of how L'Etiquette has basically exposed me to the history and culture and kind of the context and the background 
that have led to you know today's premium brands and designers. You know, one of the one of the central convictions of l'étiquette is as follows. I love this. Le vêtement n'est pas seulement une industrie, mais que l'instar du cinéma, de la littérature, du foot, du vin, c'est bien une culture. Fait des revenus historiques, sociologiques, politiques, artistiques, profondément ouvertes sur le monde, à la fois légères et profondes, totalement superficielles et absolument fondamentales. That's beautiful, that last little line. Totalement superficiel et absolument fondamental. That's a really cool juxtaposition. Growing up in Atlanta, I would always, I, you know, as a kid, I frequented this park, this playground. And I didn't realize until years, years later, like a couple years ago, reading on some architecture forum, that that playground that I played at was designed by none other than Noguchi, the Japanese, was he Japanese American? Japanese, um, Japanese architect, one of the most famous architect guys in the world, whose coffee tables are in some of the richest and most uh, tasteful homes around the world. Um, so that was a mind, that was mind blowing to me. And I think in the same way that Noguchi as an architect, his decisions are not arbitrary, right? His decisions and materials and forms of his designs, those aren't arbitrary. In that same way, the garments throughout l'étiquette, they're also just as rich in their conception. So a super cool example of this, le trench coat se porte à tout âge, à l'origine c'est un vêtement militaire. Right, so this little, this little rabats or whatever this thing is called, these little things on the back, those are originally destined for grenades, right? This is a military garment at its core. It's just like cool details like that which give you a richer appreciation. You know, walking, I'm walking around in my damn trench coat and this is the shit where I used to bring out the damn grenade. It's like, damn, man, it's cool. It gives it a, a richness. Um, you know, another great example, I think these, um, these pants are really fly. Right, you know, that's just really cool, really, you know, you feel like you just don't see it that much. Love, love, love this picture of this guy here. Very, very cool. Um, basically wearing jeans, and this is about uh, jean production in the time of, uh, of war in Berlin. At this time, wearing jeans was really a political message. It was a political symbol because um, the sale of jeans, I think, was banned in East Berlin. Uh, so the guys who wanted jeans, they would get in the car and take road trips to, I don't even know, there was some, maybe they went to Hungary, they went to Budapest, they went to some city hundreds of miles away to go get jeans. Uh, so it's like all these cool little stories about history and society. And another great example, you know, on the note of Atlanta, did you guys know there's a guy who invented grills? There's a guy who made them popular. His name is Eddie Plain. Right through l'étiquette, I find that out. Right, and there's like there's like institutions where guys in Atlanta get their grills. You know, I grew up there. I don't I don't know about any of this. And there's probably guys who have grills and don't even know where this stuff comes from. You know what I mean? So um, it's like really cool stories. He um, his family was from Suriname and they moved to Brooklyn. Anyway, on vacation one day, Eddie, um, I think he breaks his tooth eating some food or something. He goes to the dentist and without you know giving it a second thought, the dentist just puts a, a fake tooth made of gold. In this country at this time, I guess historically, they're so minerally rich that the precious metals are really accessible, right? So this was not out of the ordinary in this place. But he realizes, all right, so this is normal here. I feel like guys in New York are gonna, I feel like guys in New York might like this. And he, he brought it, he introduced it to these New York Atlanta markets. Absolutely insane. Absolutely insane. So, you know, there's a great tea here. It's kind of what I'm talking about, right? Chill out with the, you know, with the, this is the hot brand at the time, blah, blah, blah. You know, get, get more niche, get more, read up. Read up is the point. By infusing your wardrobe with these little stories that you read about, that you write about, it kind of makes it like this really cool tapestry of, you know, this is what I know about architecture and war and sex and, you know, all this, all these cool little interests. Um, you know, and it makes the act of dressing yourself feel poetic. This was also pretty great. Uh, Let's get final question when they were speaking with Tom Brown because Tom Brown always wears shorts, and um, they're like, "All right, hey man, you never, uh, you never get cold wearing your little Bermuda shorts in the dead of New York winter," and he's like, uh, "Nah, never. J'ai des bonnes cuisses." On a blood-stained tablecloth, a smoking ashtray. On one side of the table, Gay Talis, a writer at the New York Times. On another, Talis's father, a tailor from Catanzaro. At the head of the table, in a pristine three-piece suit, Joseph Bonanno. Au cours de ce dîner, mon père et Joey Bonanno se sont entendus tous les deux comme des larrons en foire. Ils ont parlé de musique. Ils ont cité des vers de leurs poèmes favoris. Mon père a oublié 
que Joey Bonanno faisait tuer chaque année des dizaines de personnes. So Talese, who went on to shape American journalism among his contemporaries Joan Didion and Hunter S. Thompson, uh, he felt that as a writer he took after his father. So he says, Avec mon stylo, carnet, mes articles et livres, je fais attention aux détails, comme mon père le faisait avec ses costumes. La minutie du tailoring et celle de l'écriture se rejoignent. J'écris comme un tailleur. Je coule le mot ensemble. I find this analogy between writing and dressing really intriguing. And Thalys is not the first guy to notice some similarities between ink and thread. Artist Bent Van Looy grew up in Anvers, in a house that was built in the Middle Ages, which actually burned down when he was two. So his dad, who is a singer in the opera, takes the family and moves them to a house in the forest. No running water, they bathe in a bathtub in the woods, right? Even in winter, in the garden. Van Looy references Les Six d'Anvers, which are the six designers who passed through the Royal Academy of Beaux-Arts in the 80s. He references them as basically a reaction to the city's grim ambiance. So Van Looy and these other painters and artists, they basically embraced color, they embraced art as a reaction to the really somber sidewalks. I think, um, de hecho, Gabriel García Márquez también, cuando fue a Bogotá por primera vez, le asombró que todo el mundo llevaba traje, que era tan gris y negro y sombre. So my favorite part of the story is when Van Looy goes to his tailor um, to see about getting a jacket made for him to wear in his studio when he's painting, when he's working. And his tailor makes the suggestion to make him a jacket in la naturelle, which is the exact same material that Van Looy uses on his, like, that's, that's what his canvases are made of. That's a beauty, you know, that's really beautiful, right? I'm wearing the exact same material is, is what this jacket is made of, and then that's the exact same material on my canvas, right? So essentially, this third character, Van Looy and Thalys, they've inspired me to basically take a more abstract, painterly approach to especially color. L'étiquette throughout issues one through seven, they basically criticize all these kind of stupid rules that, that have to do with color and kind of what you can and can't wear, right? No white after Labor Day, you know, no black and blue, all these kind of nonsensical rules, which make no sense if you just consider it from a purely artistic point of view. I went to a, um, a university, second or third year, I went to a little party, a little pregame at someone's house. And at the time, I you know, didn't have a great sense of style. I think I just got lucky that one night. I basically just wore a, um, a collared sky blue collared shirts and then a, some green cargo pants and some white uh, Air Force Ones. Anyway, I remember, I remember this vividly. The girl who I was with at the time and then random people at the party, they kept telling me, damn, man, I wouldn't think, I like your fit, you know, I wouldn't think that w uh, blue and green would go together, but you're kind of pulling it off. And it's kind of hilarious because this famous um, landscape by David Hockney, look at how cohesive these look together, right? These kind of dark, you know, dark black greens and these, and these beautiful pool blues. It looks so cohesive together. And one of the, one of the coolest palettes, one of the, it might be, it might be the sexiest palette. It might be the sexiest combination that L'Etiquette has throughout issues one through seven. Look at this combination. Look how fucking good this looks. Basically, it's, it's moving away from contrasting color palettes in your fits into more of an analogous. It gives it a very, a cohesiveness that is really appealing. This one is one of the sexiest fits in the entire magazine. Absolutely obsessed with this. So hot. So hot. Purple wine with a little lilac. So good. That's what I'm saying. When you're young, it, it would look, it's just too, it's less cohesive. It's less sophisticated if you were to have kind of a yellow under undershirt right but if you you know you, you can picture a red right a blood red or a blue a midnight blue a navy blue with this it, it's it's it gives it kind of a this is my sunset palette right this is my dawn um kind of soir soiree fit right it's it's very cohesive it's very sophisticated it reminds me of me recuerda una conversación que tuve con un director de arte el, el director de arte del país y me mostró esta portada de una revista alemana y me dijo, me, me, me acuerdo súper bien, dijo una frase muy bonita, dijo, um, y estos colores hiper elegantes. That's the thing. He was pointing out that you can't really um, see, like the blue and the, the blues and the blues are kind of mixing together. You can't really see. But that's what makes them so sophisticated. That's what makes it so intriguing and kind of classy. It's really nice. So I think analogous colors is a great takeaway. And then the second one, this is the big one, which, I've, which is why I've said it for the end. Beaucoup de maisons font des costumes trop propres. 
quand son costume est parfait, vous êtes un pantin, une statue de cire, comme un musée. I love this quote. Check out this quote. This, this might be the coolest quote in the whole book. Un jour, je déjeunais chez Lip avec une fille. Et elle me dit, t'es bien, mais t'es suspect. <laughs> T'as tout de trop parfait. Il manquait le petit défaut. Ça m'a beaucoup marqué. This is the coolest thing. So what many of these guys have pointed out is you want un truc qui déconne. You want something that's a little bit off, right? That's kind of the worst thing that you get for a man is when it looks like he spent the entire evening planning out his outfit, right? It's everything's a little bit too like, damn, bro, like relax, you know what I mean? And I've started to notice it a bit more, right? You know, I've been looking at some lookbooks, you know, Jamaican guys and kinks in the 70s. There was always a little bit of a funkiness, right? It was kind of like this collar's a little bit fucked up or, you know, I'm, I'm wearing, they, they would wear belts a lot, but the belt would be on buckle. So it's kind of like, what the hell are you doing with the belt? Um, you know, the laces and this is always kind of, you know, the rings kind of fucked up, you know, there's all these cool little idiosyncrasies and details. I've been, I've been entertaining the idea of getting a bandana in terms of form, right? It create, you know, in this neck area, it creates interesting shapes. So again, just thinking more kind of abstractly, right? I think I was at work, you know, a couple weeks ago in my collar, I was doing my thing. I had my little, my little swag, my little style popping, um, something a little bit off. And some guy came over, some guy with less style with less of a, uh, yeah, less of a look. He comes over and it's like, hey, let me help you out and fix your car. I'm like, nah, bruh, don't touch that. That's my thing. You know what I mean? So I think that's really, really cool. And that's really inspired me to kind of, you know, with my sunglasses, with my collar, with my thing, you know, just try and manipulate and just try different things with form and shape and color and palettes. So there you have it. L'étiquette, mon magazine du style des prédilections. I hope you guys see that if you want to develop an elegant, cool style, it's not going to happen on an accident. And, you know, to go back to my initial analogy, you know, we can talk all day about the chocolate bar. With these three guys, you know, we can talk about how they open theirs. You know, Srinal probably stabs his with an ice pick like a savage. Um, Talis probably deftly, you know, flicks it open with a pen. And then Tom Brown, I mean, Tom Brown, you know, wouldn't, ever be caught dead indulging in such disgusting sweets right but we can talk about how these three guys open their chocolate bar right but ultimately you are going to have to open yours and i hope that when you do you open it like you mean it